For those that experience suicidal thoughts, there comes a moment when the situation becomes critical. You may wonder to yourself, how do I know if this is a crisis situation? Whether you're having those thoughts yourself or somebody that you know are having those thoughts. There are some various things that we can be aware of and to keep an eye out for, which we have and will discuss some of those aspects of signs or symptoms to keep in mind. The best thing that I can tell you of how to know if a situation is critical is use your instincts. I promise you that your instincts will serve you so much better than you give yourself credit for. Use your instincts. and Use your relationship to your advantage that you have with that person. If you know an individual that has been a happy nature and always outgoing, suddenly have a change in who they are that makes you wonder and ask yourself the question, they're not the same person anymore. Why are they acting this way? Use your instincts and have that conversation with them. That conversation can be and is very difficult because as you notice some of those signs and symptoms and those red flags, those cries for help, it is critical that we ask difficult but direct questions. Those questions start off with, are you having thoughts of suicide? Or are you having thoughts of killing yourself? I know that one of my biggest fears of asking that question is what if the answer is yes? And to help you be prepared and to feel more confident and capable, if you find yourself in that situation where you need to ask that question and ask it without dread and almost with a neutral body language, the first thing you should do after they answer that question is thank them. Thank them for having the courage to share with you what they are really experiencing, what they feel, even if you don't understand. It's okay that you haven't been a mile in their shoes and you may have no idea what that feels like, but thank them for that courage because I guarantee you, if you are like me and feel that anxiety or that fear of what that answer may be in asking that question, are you having thoughts of suicide? The individual you're asking is experiencing something very similar in the fear and the unknown and the pain of what they are feeling. After we ask that question and the answers we get, it's important that we follow up. After we thank them for sharing that, that truth and being honest and open with you, ask them some things to be able to evaluate what is the need at that moment. Questions like, have you made a plan? Have you gathered means? How long have you been feeling this way? Have you talked to somebody else about how you felt this way? And respond accordingly. If they have a plan, if they have gathered means, get them help. It's important that we are there to support and help them. Stay with them. Don't leave them alone. It's important that we embrace the discomfort of these vital conversations that need to take place at times. It's not a comfortable thing, but we need to be okay with that discomfort. And reach out. Be transparent. If they ask you why you're asking that question, let them know, I've noticed some changes and I'm concerned for you. I'm worried about you. I care for you. I love you. As you listen to these interview segments, be mindful of what it is that you feel you would do in that situation, of how you can have that conversation and the impact that it had on these individuals' lives. One of my, our fondest memories that I had was we're both kind of kids at heart, and so we went to San Diego for our honeymoon, and I loved going to Legoland. That was probably like a serious highlight. Believe it or not, we played GameCube, and so we play Mario Party all the time, and I always beat him, so that's always fun. So about a year and a half ago, Ben started to have really bad anxieties, and He's kind of always been depressed since probably his mission. He got sick six months in and had to come home. And then he just kind of felt like a disappointment. And then, uh, so he just kind of was depressed, but you could really notice it like the past year and a half. And he was kind of in between jobs. And so I wasn't sure if he had insurance or not. Cause I was like, we need to get you help, you know, and you need to go see someone. And we just wouldn't know if he had insurance. So we never 
Like I didn't push it any further. Like his depression and anxiety and stuff was causing him to miss work. And he was like lying to me about it a little bit. It's just really hard. And the worst thing was like, I mentioned divorce once. And then I think he just got to the point where he felt like he couldn't improve anymore. And then we got in a fight the morning. And when I got home from work, we got in a fight. And I was like, I, you know, if you lose your job, like I can't go through this again. And then when I got home, like I was just angry. I took a nap and then I went and was babysitting my sister's kids. And he asked if he could like come. And I was like, no, because I just wanted to be like away, you know? I was actually gone um, an extra hour because my sister went to dinner and they were really slow. So she wasn't home. And so when she got home, I left and I found him. And he had like written a note and everything. And he was still alive, which is like the worst part. Sorry. <laughs> um, and yeah, and like we're in a new subdivision. And um, so when I was on the phone with a lady, the ambulance couldn't even find the house. I think one of the hardest things is like, I used a gun that we bought like a month before and I bought him the ammo for Christmas. So it's like a lot of guilt on me. Cause I'm like, I feel like this is all my fault. I know it's not, but doesn't change like that guilt that I'm always gonna have. He was like a great guy. And I know that depression like is so real. I used to not even really think twice about it. Like it's a real thing and I just didn't take it serious or else I would have like made him get help. And like I think he knew that he needed it but he was scared to ask and I didn't wanna push. And I thought like I had faith so I don't know if that makes me like naive but I had faith that everything would be okay and that it would get better, you know? But things don't really get better if you don't work at it. He never felt like he was good enough for his family. And he had, didn't have very many friends. He had a hard time making friends. And the one close friend that we had, um, they moved up to Layton. So we didn't really see him all that often. And the friends that were really close to him in high school, they just were always busy and he couldn't hang out. And like I'm the social one, so you know I would make us get out and go do stuff, but he just didn't really talk that all that often. <sighs> I feel like I've lost like so much. I know that I'm not alone, and like people will tell me, you know, we're all here, but it's really opened my eyes to like who is really here. But I know that this whole experience, I feel like it's made me a stronger person. I just got to the point and I'm like, I need help. So when this first happened, I was kind of scared to go back home, which is understandable. And so I moved in with my sister for about a month and it really helped to have that support. And then after that, I decided to go home and I didn't even sleep in the bedroom for like a month, I just slept on the couch. And then I finally worked up to going in the bedroom and I'm fine, you know, being in the house. People will always ask me, like, you should sell it, or why don't you sell it? Or is it uncomfortable? You know, I'm like, no, like, it feels right. It feels like it's home. I tried to do some new hobbies and stuff. I tried to learn guitar. It didn't work very good, but I tried. And, you know, since I have the yard, doing yard work and stuff has helped me. I have recently I've been seeing a therapist. For me personally, talking to people that are not in my immediate family group has helped me more. Um, I can find a lot in people from work and my neighbors because they don't know Ben on a personal level. And so they're kind of that like third party person that is there for me. One of the other things that has really helped me cope is I joined uh, LDS Widow and Widowers page on Facebook and if you're not religious there are like lots of other pages and people that you can talk to but that's helped me because it's a lot of single people who have lost loved ones and so getting on there and replying back to their comments and posting things that you're struggling with has really helped me to cope with things. So I think that the worst thing that I have seen people like say and people post 
um, again, going back to me being religious, I do believe in heaven, and people post that since they took their own life that it's just murder and that they're not going to go to heaven. And it breaks my heart when people say that because I know that he's going to heaven. Like, he was a good person, and I know that God's forgiving, and he won't judge you because you have a mental illness, and that is what suicide is. It's a mental illness that you struggle with. And I think that's the most hurtful thing that people have ever said. One of the things that people who are thinking about taking their own lives, they don't think of the consequences of everything else. They think about getting rid of their pain, but it's not getting rid of their pain, it's just passing it along to someone else. I don't think he thought that it would affect everyone the way that it did. I don't think that he thought that it would pull his family apart. And I know that and he wanted me to have a better life, but I don't think they realized that maybe I already had a good life. I think that we could have made things work. I think that he could have been happier. You know, I encourage people to get help. People who haven't spoken to people in a long time, like, don't judge them and pick up your phone and just go through your contacts or people that you haven't heard from in a long time and just call them or send them a quick text that just says, hey, hope you're doing okay, I've been thinking about you. And it could be the change between, you know, life and death and how they are feeling. Just to know that that one person cares about you. And one of the things that I've been thinking of for a couple months now is that when I am at my lowest point, because I've been there, I was at a point where I'm like, I'm not going to take my own life, but I wouldn't care what happened to me. When you're at that lowest point, that's how they felt every day. And that's, I don't want to say that's what keeps me going, but that's what, like, has helped me is to realize that, you know, this is how they're actually doing. Like, they're not doing okay. And to kind of get that glimpse of what they're going through, I feel like that's what it would be like. It's hard to accept what happened. I wish he knew how much he was loved because at his funeral, there was the most people there that I'd like ever seen, and people that loved him and loved his family and loved me and were there to support us. And I wish that he knew that all those people loved him. My philosophy is just day by day. Don't let people tell you that you need to move on because you're never gonna move on. Like, I hate that phrase. I like the phrase, move forward. He was a part of my life and I'm not gonna forget him. So if people tell you that you need to move on, that it's time to move on, like, move at your own pace. Lots of people grieve differently. Lots of people grieve, you know, at different paces. But just remember to get back up. Don't stay down. Rely on the people that are around you. They want to help you and they care for you. Even if they don't say it. I found that I felt like I've been, like, meant for more. Like, one day I can help people. I feel like hopefully doing this I can. Our call to action is to help you to know what to do if you find yourself in a crisis situation where you're asking these difficult questions and having these difficult conversations. I would tell you one thing is to appear like a duck on the water. If you look at a duck that's swimming on the water, it looks smooth, but if you looked at their feet underneath, they are paddling a mile a minute. It's okay to be distressed on the inside. Do everything you can to not show that in your emotions when you're having that conversation. Take a deep breath. Think to yourself that you've got this. Think to yourself, what would you be willing to do or what would you be willing to not do to keep that person here alive and well with you just one more day? And then reach out. If it is a crisis situation that needs that help right at that moment, some resources that are very good are the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. For the state of Utah, the Safe UT app. Also, 911 is a great resource to be able to get somebody the help that they need. Choose to embrace that discomfort, to talk about the difficult things that need to be talked about. And as we do, I know we will save lives and make the difference for good.